Hello, everyone. Good to be with you. And so, let's talk. <laughs> let's talk. And so, we're going to talk this morning a little bit about a story that I'm going to share with you because it's my story. The story, the way I got involved, and maybe where we're even going to go in the future. So, my story begins with a story. And so, we're going to roll the calendar back to the year 1970. And at that time, my husband Bill and I were living in California on a Navy base where he was doing research and where I was working in the local schools on the base. And I was the person in charge of what they called it school feeding, the lunches, the breakfast, and nutrition education, and that sort of thing. And so while I was working there, um, I always was tuned in to hear what was going on in other places. And I found the U.S. Agency for International Development was calling for volunteers. Would volunteers be able to go to other countries, particularly the poor countries, the developing countries? And in those countries, would they help start some sort of nutrition program or feeding program for children? Now, at this point, let me pause and simply say that in all of life's path, and we all travel it, there are times an event that happens that changes forever the way we feel about the world and its people. And so the story I'm telling you is the story of that event, what happened and how it happened. And so now we're back to USAID and the call they made for help. And so the volunteers were being selected. I applied, I was accepted, and I was sent to Tunisia in North Africa. Well, why Tunisia? Well, there were 850,000 starving children in that country. Our country was sending them some food assistance. And so it was my task to go there and see what we might do to use this food to help feed some of these most deserving children. And so that started me on a path that I followed for a long time, actually over 40 years. And it's a path that keeps changing, but choosing the path, making the commitment to try to do something on that path, has been the fun and the excitement of this whole journey. And so now we are in Tunisia. And what's going on there? I mentioned the starving children, but what in the world could I do in a situation like that? Well, as it turned out, they had plans for me, and they said my task was to go into the South Sahara Desert, way down, way down in Tunisia. And in that place, I was to try to see what position might be available. Could people help? Was there food available? What might be done? And so I was sent down there. But before I left, in Tunis, where we had an embassy, I went to the American embassy, looked around, and found a little store about the size of a clothes closet. And in that store, they had one box of animal crackers. And so it occurred to me that that might be fun to buy a box of animal crackers and have it on the trip and maybe use it somewhere. And so then, some days later, I was far down in the Sahara, in a little oasis village. And I had done a little reading about that place. The longevity rate was 35 years. And this simply meant that children had no families, no parents. And they also had no homes. And they were running in packs like little animals, trying to find food any place that they could. So when I arrived there, I got out of the car, and the minute I stepped out, I was surrounded, surrounded by children, arms outstretched, pleading for food. And it occurred to me, this must be Animal Cracker Day, <laughs> if there ever was one. So this is it. That's why I have the crackers. And so I opened the crackers, and there were so many children that I broke the crackers in half. One little guy would get a head, somebody else would get the tail, and I tried as much as I could to stretch the animal crackers, and then I finally ran out altogether. And just as I was getting ready to leave, I felt someone pulling on my dress. I looked down on my left side, and here was this tiny girl, probably three years old. She was barefoot. She was dressed in rags. Her hair had never been combed. It was just like a mop on top of her head. And then uh, I looked at her more closely, 
And I could see that her malnutrition had progressed to the point, as it often does, where the body cells begin to break down. In her case, there was a heavy discharge running out of her eyes, her nose, and her mouth, and there were maggots crawling in this filth on her face. And I didn't have even an animal cracker for a starving child. That day, I had a hard time accepting what was happening to that child, but even a harder time knowing what was happening to me. Because here I was, a nutritionist, a master's degree in nutrition from a prestigious university. That's just wonderful. But I was not able to help that starving child. And so I decided that day, that hour, in that tiny little village, that I would do what I could to try to prevent tragedies like this from happening in the future. And so we go ahead now. 40 years later have passed. Today, we have a global child nutrition foundation in Washington, D.C. Um, it's working in so many countries. I have the privilege of being the president of that foundation. But the important thing is, what are we doing in the foundation to help alleviate hunger, malnutrition, and help children learn and go to school? Education is the key to this whole business. And so in the foundation, we actually have developed a, a path to help these people, uh, and we do it through education. We work in many countries now, and in these countries, we don't give money, we don't give food. We give technical assistance and training, and now we meet at ministry levels and tell them and help them say, what do you want to do? What are your goals? And then we'll help you decide how you might be able to do that. So we, in a sense, are simply teaching the countries how to fish, how to take care of themselves. We're not giving them the help. We're showing them how to do it themselves. Here an example of some of our fishermen. Uh, this picture was taken in, this, in South Africa. Uh, we do a forum every year. We bring a large number of people together for training for a week. This group happened to have been in South Africa. And you see here the diversity of the group, people learning how to fish in their countries and take care of their own people. And there are so many examples of some changes that are happening, changes that we've been able to help make. For example, in Brazil, Brazil has amended its constitution of the nation to say that food at school is a human right for the child. And then we can move on to Colombia and Bogota. I had the privilege of going to Bogota at the invitation of that country. And I really wondered if I should go. I called the State Department and they said, no, it's not safe. And I wrote them and said I couldn't. And they immediately sent a, a wire back and said, you know, Mrs. White, you come, trust us and trust God. And so I say, how can you say no to that kind of a deal? <laughs> so I went, got there, and I had thought this was their first ever conference in Brazil on school feeding, and I expected 35 or 40 people. There were 800 that showed up. They came in from the Andes, they came from everywhere. We met in an old government building in Bogota, and uh, on the roof of the building were police with guns drawn to protect us while we walked in because of narco-terrorism in the country right at that very time. We can think of Angola. We're working now in Benguela province. Benguela is one of the poorest countries in all of, of, all, of all of Africa, really Benguela and Angola. 80% of the people in Angola live on less than $2 a day. Slums like this are typical everywhere, and this is even a better slum. And so we find that as we work with these people, in Benguela, for example, we're training 2,000 PTA members on how to operate their little school feeding program so they're safe and clean and nutritionally adequate as best they have food to provide for it. So it's a challenge, but people are wonderful. People want to learn. They can't read or write, but that's all right. That's okay. We can still help them and show them how to do it right, and they want so much to learn. I guess the one thing that I've learned on this journey is that the world's children belong to us all. They're different. That's fine. But they are our children. They need help on our watch. And education is clearly the door. Open it. That means a child can have education, 
help break the poverty cycle, go ahead and become a productive citizen in that community and in that country. And on a broader scale, I believe that is one of the steps toward world peace. Not the only one, but it's a very important one. Now we're going to move around a little bit and go to another situation that's quite different. I've seen the benefits of school feeding for so many children, so many. I've seen so much starvation, but I've also seen the benefits. This little fellow is in China, as you can see. He's wearing a, a Boy Scout uniform that was given to him by children in this country. He is a victim of the Sichuan earthquake in 2008. And I was called down there to help see what we could do to feed those children who were homeless. 90,000 people were killed. Many of them were children. And their parents were gone. And they were living at school, in a tent school, in Dian, which is the earthquake recovery area. And so little fellows like this were trying to get a second start now. The important thing to see here is that he's eating at a little table that looks very nice and clean. That table was donated to the children of China at the earthquake time by the children in Japan. So there's a connection there. It's a wonderful connection on the way these things can fall together. But for those children, food at school became a lifeline for survival. Now we have some fun too, we really do. It isn't all serious work. And here you see Yoming. Uh, this was taken a year ago in China, and in China, we started a school feeding program for some of the poorest children in rural, remote areas. And so to celebrate that big day, uh, Yoming and I were asked to, to open this. We were the, the celebrities that day, and you can see, <laughs> we are truly the odd couple. <laughs> I told Yoming, I said, Yoming, we are the odd couple. We are the long and the short of the story. <laughs> and you and I show what good nutrition can do. You grow tall and I grow old. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. <laughs> it, it was so funny, and the thing is, he didn't even smile because he speaks no English. <laughs> and he missed my wonderful joke, and I thought that was so sad because I really enjoyed it. I could tell you a lot more stories, but I'm not going to. The important thing is that a journey was started 40 years ago. A path was selected, and that was around that same time. And it's been a long journey, one in which there has been discouragement, where there has been success. One in which there has been frustration, and one where there has been achievement. One which occasionally there's even been a little danger and where there's been much safety and rewards. So there are two sides to this whole story. But helping children be fed and educated is the important thing. We know that when food is at school, the enrollment often doubles. We know that more children, and especially girls, will stay in school and finish all six years of primary school. We know that an adult woman who has had two years of primary school, just two, not six, two years. On the average, that woman will have fewer children. The children she has will be healthier and more likely to go to school, and particularly the girls. So why not feed them? Why not educate them? It's the path to the future. And so we move ahead now. Uh, we move ahead. Uh, progress is being made. I said it was marked by different degrees of success and failure. But it's continually an opportunity to be motivated by the people and by the children because the children are our very best teachers. And so looking back in these 40 years, I keep wondering, why do I do this? Why would anyone do this? When I started this 40 years ago, there was all this poverty and starvation, but there's even more today. What in the world has happened here? But I know, I know, because I've been there, that what we've done has helped control starvation. There would be many more today if we weren't doing what we're doing, although it's still terribly high, and it's a global tragedy. And so in all of this, in all of this work, um, I have changed. Uh, I find that um, material things are much less important to me now. I find that um, I will see both sides of an issue, in the countries I often work with such contentious 
situations where ministers of education and agriculture are at swords points and others are involved in this. And what do you do about it? But I find now that on those situations, I can often see both sides of the question and try to help mediate that, which is one of the things that I have to do. I find that I have become more patient, more accepting of our vulnerability, of our differences, understanding that we're all one. I have found that uh, I can dream. Uh, I can dream of um, things that needed to be done. New ideas that could be tested, that maybe will be sometime. And I'm more willing to take risks, risks of any kind, because of the work we're doing that is so important. And then there has been a price to pay in all of this. And I think it's only fair to mention that there are some downsides. And one of the prices that I have felt burdened with is something like this. Here in our home of South Whidbey, I've had such wonderful support and encouragement from our community and all of you. However, in the earlier days, you need to know there was a time when some people would think I was running around for fun. When people would say, why don't you stay home and take care of things here? Why do you mess around with all that stuff? And so creating awareness and support here has been a wonderful thing that's happened. But it didn't always start that way. And then there are also some other things that are downsides, and one is the difficulties of travel, and also illness and things that happen in these countries. There is a word that I learned in South Africa some years ago, and that word is Ubuntu, U-B-U-N-T-U. It simply means, I am because we are. In other words, I am who I am because you are part of my life and I am part of yours. We are together. We are connected forever. That is a sacred word in much of Africa. The tribes have their own way of saying it. You can Google Ubuntu when you get home. Do it. You be you into you. It was a word used by Nelson Mandela, by Bishop Tutu, and many others when they were working with apartheid. So Ubuntu. I am, we are, because we are. People uh, often wonder why we do all this, and I've been to some of the answers to that. But I ask myself, am I making a difference? Have I ever honestly, openly looked at my own self and my own life and said, why do you do this? Why do you do this? And so I feel confident in saying this. If it is possible to help one country, or one village, or even one child have food and education, that would be enough for me. That would be enough. Once you start on a journey and choose your path to follow, there's no way of turning back. And so it's a joy and a pleasure to keep moving ahead as best we can under some very dull conditions. But the bottom line is education and food helps the child, helps the country, and is a step towards, I believe, peace on our earth. Thank you so much. Thank you.